Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's so great to see each and every one of you. It's always great to be gathered with God's people. And uh, it's great to have some wonderful warmer weather this past week as well. Amen. Amen. Just a foretaste of spring coming. I'm also as glad to see today that the, the, the side is, is shifted a little bit. Last week, I know everybody's on this side, so we've spread out a little bit. So just want to say welcome. If you're a guest here, we want you to know that you're welcome you're always welcome, and I share that also to our folks online. We want to welcome them, and uh, even if they're eavesdropping just for a few minutes, we want them to know they're always welcome, whether online or in person as well. I want to just share a few prayer requests, or not, we'll get to some prayer requests, but I want to make some announcements first. They should show up on the screen here. Uh, Sunday school has resumed. We're still uh, moving through the book of Revelation, don't uh, miss out on that over here in the kitchen of the Ed Building. Coffee's prepared as well. Brother Jeff and Phillips leading us through that. I started a little bit late trying to record it, but we're trying to record those and put those on our website under the media tab. So if you miss a week or if you may say, I'm, I'm doing something else with another group at that time, you can catch up uh, to those. We're going to try to post those on our website. So come and join us for that or catch up online. D groups have started, but it's still not too late to join one. Let me know about that. Gospel at every home. The rest of what I want to talk about today really revolves around that. That's a big initiative that we're, we've, all, we've started and we're taking part of now. So I want to mention a few things. First off, there's some bookmarks in the back on your way out that share some dates. Some of those dates have been altered. I'll, I'll make some of those clarifications right now. Uh, for instance, number one, the, the first thing is the 40 days of prayer. We started that last Monday. That means today is day number seven, if you're following along with us. I think there's still some booklets back here as you go out the door there on the left. If you don't have a booklet, you want to pray along with us, I encourage you to do that. Some of you may say, you know what, David, I can't actually go out door to door when we go out. But you may say, but you know what, I can pray. And, and that is so important for what we're doing here is we take the gospel to every home. And you'll see, even as I get into my message today, the importance of that. So get one. Join with us. Tomorrow will be day eight as we start our second week in that. Lord willing, it should finish up on Good Friday, right before Easter. Prayer walking. That was supposed to be last Sunday, but because of the weather, we canceled that. We have moved that to this coming Wednesday night. So instead of our regular Bible study and prayer time, we're going to meet together at 6.30. Now that's a little bit earlier than our 7 o'clock, 6.30 on Wednesday, 
And then we're going to have just a short training. And then we're going to split up and go out. Most of it's going to be prayer driving. Because the area that we've got to cover in our zip code, 40402, a lot of it's going to be driving. So I encourage you to come. We'll do a short training. Then we'll split up and kind of drive and pray. Um, maybe with our different families and different groups. A packing party today at 5 p.m., similar to our packing parties that we have for the shoebox ministry today at 5 o'clock. We need several hands to come. We've got about five or 600 of these packets that we need to put together. So come today, 5 o'clock, and, and join us for that. Next Sunday, we're actually going to be having a training about how to go door to door when we finally go out in the coming weeks. The 14th will be the first Sunday that we actually start going out. So next Sunday, the 7th, right after service, we're going to go over here to the Ed Building. And we've, as you can see on there, we've got a meal that's going to be catered in by uh, Renee Bowman and, and her business and, and uh, her family's barbecue business. And if you've not tried their food, you're missing out. And you're going to have an opportunity next Sunday. So no excuse to go home, get food out of the oven, or run off and eat. We're going to eat together as a church family, and then we're going to have the training right after that. So trying to remove any excuses, but also that will give us just a, a sweet time of fellowship and to spend time with one another. And we'll make sure that uh, all the, the health precautions are, are followed just in, in these days of pandemic. So next Sunday, seven, uh, the 7th. T-shirts. We're taking up a new order for T-shirts. As you go out the door back here on the table, there's a clipboard with a sign-up sheet, and we've got several different options. Make sure you get that in because we're going to try to get those to Abby Smith tomorrow so she can start ordering those so we can have them for when we start going door to door. One final thing, uh, there's going to be a children's class that's starting up next week. We're still working on a preschool leader, but or children 7 up to middle school is going to have a class next week at 9.30, kind of during the, the Sunday school hour. Okay, I've said a lot. Anything that I've missed, anybody wants to mention something? Okay. Yeah, yeah. prayer question. We're going to share just some praises. And the first praise, of course, we see Miss Linda Hacker back here. We're so glad to have her here with us. Praise the Lord. We've been missing you, Linda, and praying for you, so it's so great to see you. Also, Sharon Allen mentioned a praise for us. Her nephew, David, has been healed of throat cancer. Is that right? So let's give the Lord a round of applause on that as well. So often we're asking for requests and we're praying, and sometimes we forget God always answers. God always works, and sometimes we forget to look back and give Him praise. So let's just do, give Him praise for that. So, uh, Also, several requests. We want to keep praying for our community for the coronavirus, we want to keep praying for the lost. Any other special requests that anybody would like to mention this morning? Okay, Casey. My sister's getting her um, results from chemo uh, Thursday to find out if it's working. So. Okay, so we pray for your sister. That's Mary, right, yes. Casey? Okay, we'll keep praying for Casey's sister, Mary. Anything else? Keep praying for Haley and Trevor. Okay, keep praying. we certainly keep praying for that couple. All right. Jonathan? For the travel of the Isaacs. Yeah, the, the Isaacs, yeah, Jenna and Jackson and, and Wade traveling back from Alabama, I think, right? All right, we'll pray for them, traveling journey mercies, traveling mercies. What about unspoken quests by, by a show of hand? Okay. All right. Brother Jeff, you're up front here. Lead us in prayer, if you don't mind, to pray for some of these requests. Heavenly Father God, Lord, we thank you again for this day of life that you've given us. Lord, just thank you for the privilege that we have of gathering together in your house. It is a sweet privilege to gather one with another, Lord. Thank you for each and every one that's come this way. Lord, we do lift up the requests that have been mentioned, Lord, whether it be the lost, the sick, the bereaved, Lord, those that are traveling. We ask your traveling mercies upon them, those that are recovering from illnesses, Lord. Lord, those that are going through illnesses, Lord, we, we know that we live in a time of, uh, you know, this the, the coronavirus that's spread across our land and, and across the world. We ask your mercy on those that have, have had it and are recovering, those that, uh, that, that may get it, Lord, that uh, your mercy will be upon those. Lord, just, just heal our land if it be your will. 
God, we know that there's a lot of division in our land right now. Be with our people. Lord, we ask that uh, there be more acceptance of you, Lord. Our leaders, we know that your godly counsel is available to them if they'll just accept it, Lord. Lord, now be with us. Lead, guide, and direct us. Be with our pastor. He brings us the very word we need for this hour. And Lord, as we go forth into our community, Lord, Lord, we pray that you'll be with us, upgird us, give us the strength that we have to bring your word to this community and to shine your light and your love into the darkness that surrounds us. Lord, we ask these things to be your will. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jeff. Uh, any birthdays or anniversaries that we can recognize or mention? Dave York had a birthday. That's right. He's not here. He's not feeling well. We want to pray for him, make sure he gets to feeling better. So we'll, uh, we rejoice with him. If nothing else, I'm going to turn it back to, to Brother Greg. <coughs> Let's turn to page 262. 262. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I Uh, 213 213 <clears throat> Are you weary? Are you heavy? Are Such a friend, 
give the Lord a big round of applause this morning. That's why we're here to praise Him. I'm going to open God's Word now. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. If you want to start turning there with me. I'm going to continue our journey, our walk through the Gospel of Mark. It's going to take us through the rest of the year. Uh, Lord willing, if, if Jesus Christ doesn't return, we're hoping to be finished with Mark by the end of the year and we'll turn our attention to a, a different book in, in 2022. I've already mentioned the warmer weather this past week and had a chance to, to go to Walmart last week. It was a bit of an adventure. As always, uh, every trip to Walmart, it's an adventure, right? But as I, I entered into Walmart... One of the first things that I saw, because, you know, they're always moving the seasons and always getting ready for something. I'd be surprised if they don't have fireworks ready already. But, but in this particular uh, area I walked through, it was nothing but seeds getting ready for uh, the planting season, whether it was vegetable seeds or flower seeds. Of course, I thought of my lovely wife who loves flowers and loves to plant them. And, and today we're going to be talking about uh, planting seeds. And I felt like it was just so appropriate in the season we are and the, the passage that God is, has led us to as we've moved through the Gospel of Mark. And today's message is simply titled, Abundant Sowing. Abundant Sowing. So if you're willing and able, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be Mark chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 20. A lot of verses to cover, but so important. You're going to find a very familiar passage here. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. And he began again, of course this is Jesus, and began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower... To sow, And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables." that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, Choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. As always, God, we thank you that the truth that Jesus is sharing uh, so many years back then, Father, is a truth that's still applicable for us today. So I just pray that your spirit would help us to see and understand what you would have us to know, God, and then we would then, as we go out those doors, we would live it. God, we wouldn't just be hearers, we'd be doers of the word as well, God. So may we be encouraged, may we be challenged by your word, may it not be me speaking, but may it be you speaking through me this morning. In your son's name we pray, amen. amen. You can go ahead and, and be seated. 
Again, in this passage, as we've seen several times through the Gospel of Mark, because Jesus was doing many miraculous things and he was teaching in such a way that he had authority that the crowds continued to press in on him. And in this particular time, as he's here in the Sea of Galilee, what's he do? He gets in a boat, he sits down, he gets pushed back away from the shore a little bit. The crowds are on the shore and Jesus starts to teach the people. Now, in those days, when a rabbi would teach, he would actually sit down to teach, and the people would be standing. So most of them probably standing on the shore, shoreline, and Jesus sitting down. Now, in, in today's world, it's, it's completely opposite, because look here. I'm standing up as a teacher, preacher. You guys are all sitting down. So just this, this flip side, the flipping of, of how things were done here, just a bit of a, a side note here. But it says here that Jesus, he started teaching the people in what's called parables. And actually, from this point on in Mark's gospel, and although Mark isn't always as chronological as, say, Luke and and some of the other gospels, we see that from this point on, Jesus primarily teaches the crowds. He teaches the multitudes using parables. Now, what is a parable? I think all of us have been in church. We've heard that term. We generally know what it is. Somebody once described a parable to me like this. Said it's it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And I thought, ah, that's, that's pretty good. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But when you look at this word parable, it is literally, it literally means to place or to lay alongside. So it's taking two things and laying them alongside each other for comparison in, in a way to explain or in a way to illustrate. It's in essence using something that's familiar to explain the unfamiliar. And this is something that the rabbis in those days used frequently. They used parables quite a lot to help people understand deep spiritual, deep heavenly truths. Now, I just want to give just a bit of a quick introduction here about parables because we're going to see Jesus teaching and speaking on parables in in the coming passages. So it's important to just get just a little background for them, not only to understand what they are, but their purpose as well. Because when you look at this passage that we read through, and we're not going to go back and read through because I mean, there's a lot of verses there. But in verses 9 through 12, Jesus gives us the purpose or the reason that he spoke to the people in parables. And the first reason is this, is to clarify truth for believers. He wanted to clarify the truth for the believers. But also parables' intention was to hide it, hide truth from unbelievers. And we, some of us hear that and we're like... Now, Dave, well, that's strange. Hiding truth from unbelievers? Don't we want unbelievers to know the truth? Wouldn't God want that? But we see that parables were to be understood by those who truly wanted to know the truth, that were truly seeking the truth. And then they were not to be understood by those who were constantly rejecting Jesus, constantly rejecting the truth, constantly hardening their heart against Jesus, like we saw the scribes a couple weeks ago when Jesus spoke of the unforgivable sin. And why is that? Because simply they did not want to know the truth. They, they kept resisting. They kept hardening their hearts in this. So to clarify truth for believers, to hide the truth for those who hardened their hearts and rejected Christ and pushed away. But in, this, in today's passage here, in this parable, we're going to see the parable, and we read it already, the parable of the sower. That's what we sometimes call it, but actually it's really the parable of the four soils because that's what he spends a lot of time talking about. We're going to come back to that in, towards the end. But not only is this one of the most familiar parables that we see in God's Word, we see also that it is a parable through which, almost like a lens through which we can understand and try to see what Jesus is talking about in all the other parables. Now, I'm guessing if some of you, if you grew up in church, this is a story that you heard often. Or if you're a Sunday school teacher or a children's teacher, you've probably used this. I remember even back when the pandemic started, Tetch and Jotham told this story in video form for our kids because we weren't able to meet. It's a very common story. But Jesus basically says there's a sower. And this sower or this farmer, he goes out and what's he doing? He's sowing seeds. That's what a sower does. And this seed is the sower, is this, is this farmer, is this sower going out. He just starts throwing the seed and it starts to land on different soils. And Jesus mentions four soils in which this seed lands. The first soil is this is the hard roadside soil. 
And what happens because the, the road and the, and the roadside, as you can imagine in those days, these dirt roads, people would walk them and over and over. And as the people walked more and more on them, what would happen to the dirt? It would be compacted, become very hard. And Jesus said when the seed landed on that soil, that hard roadside, compacted soil, what would the birds, the fowls, the King James says, the birds would come and they would snatch it away. So that's the first soil. The second soil is the rocky, shallow soil. And when the seed goes into the rocky, shallow soil, it, it, takes, it sprouts, it takes up some roots, but because there's no depth because of the rock, you know, the, the roots go down, they hit the rock, they don't have a lot of depth in their roots. So when the sun comes out, what happens to that plant? It withers away. That's the second soil. The third soil is the thorny soil. And what happens with thorny soil? Well, when the, when the soil is sold into this soil, it might have at first, it might have looked like it was good soil. But what the, the sower didn't know is that mixed in that soil is also weeds and other thorns, thorny weeds. So as that seed started to sprout and grow, the weeds and the thorns grew faster and overtook it and choked it out until it died and withered away. And then the fourth soil, of course, is the most desirable one, is the good soil. And he said when the seeds landed on that soil, it started to take root and sprout and it grew up and it produced 30 and 60 and 100 times compared to that one seed that grew in that soil. Now, what, what does this mean for us? Now, the good thing about this parable, now this isn't the case with every parable, but the good thing about this parable is Jesus actually explains it to his followers. So we, he makes sure that we don't miss the point on this one. And we see that when you get to, uh, to verses 14 through 20, the last part of the passage that we read, it's simply just Jesus explaining this parable to us. Because verse 13 indicated Jesus' question. He's like, don't you understand this? It makes it clear that Jesus' followers, his disciples, and those that were following him at that time, they didn't quite understand what he was talking about with the four soils. So let's, let's walk through it. Let's see what Jesus is trying to say to us. So he says the sower. First off, he says, what's, what's the seed? It's the word of God. Now, who is the sower? I think it's implied. He doesn't tell us, but I think it's implied that the sower is Jesus himself. So Jesus is going out. And he's sowing the word of God, just like seeds. And the first one lands on the hard roadside. So let's go back through these. And what does he say about this? What kind of person? Because he says these soils are like people. What's this soil like? What kind of person? Well, he says it's this person who is constantly rejecting or who has constantly rejected the gospel, the word of God, and continually not only rejects it, but hardens their heart against the good news about Jesus Christ. And so when they harden it, the seed's not the seed of the gospel can't take root. And so what happens? Satan comes along and snatches the seed away. And then they continue to be in bondage to not only Satan, but also in bondage to sin because we know Jesus and the gospel sets us free, breaks the bonds of sin. So if I was going to say, what's the application point for this soil for us, for I would say for unbelievers, but also you could say for believers, is simply this. Quickly receive and embrace the word of God. And I would even add to that and put it to use. Don't just hear it. Don't just let Satan come and take it away. But quickly receive and embrace and put to good use. The second soil, let's move on. The rocky shallow soil. He says, hey, this type of soil is those people who may hear the gospel message and they may quickly embrace it and on the outside it seems that they are a true believer and they might even get into the waters of baptism and say, you know what, I'm, I'm all in for this. But then what happens as difficulty, as the difficulties and challenges of the world starts to come their way, what happens because they have not taken deep root, they're not truly a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, what happens to them? They wither away. And I've seen so many people like this in my day. People who come forward, they say, yes, I want to follow Jesus Christ. They might even be baptized, and then maybe after a week or two, you don't see them ever again. 
People who on the out world, outside seem to become followers of Jesus, but as, as 1 John tells us, they, were never, they went out from us because they were never truly a part of us. And then the, so, so the application for this one is this. Put the word of God deep into your soul. Put the word of God deep in your soul. Pray that the spirit would put it deep in your soul, that we would hide God's word in our heart so that we would not sin against God. So the third, let's go to the third soil now. The thorny soil. These are the people who are double-minded and love both Jesus and the world. Now, this is a strong word for our culture and our day. And I think the church in America, because you've got people, and I think the thorny soul is those that have their allegiance split between Jesus, following Jesus, doing what's right, living a righteous, holy, good life, and following and seeking after the riches and the ways of the world with the fame and the pleasures and the power and all that accompanies it. And again, they show that they're not truly followers of Jesus Christ because they've not completely submitted themselves to him because Christ demands us to submit ourselves fully to him and his lordship. It's not Jesus and plus plus. It's Jesus alone. This is who Jesus Christ calls to be his followers because we submit to him as king of kings, lord of lords, and lord over all. Because don't miss this. Here's the thing. Those who truly love Jesus will forsake the world. And those who truly love the world will forsake Jesus. And we need to make sure that we truly love Jesus and forsake the world. That, that the world does not become an idol to us. And so the application for this soil would be simply this. Keep your focus on the word of God. Keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your allegiance on Jesus. And then we come to the fourth and final soil. The good soil. The people who hear the word, they hear the gospel message, and what do they do? They accept it. They receive it. They're born again into the family of God, and they start to produce fruit in their life, and they start to multiply themselves 30, 60, and 90. And this is the type of soil that Jesus wanted people to be. This is the type of soil that we want people to be to embrace this. And you know, in those days, the farmers could expect maybe six to eight times the, 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 the return for that seed. Maybe ten times. So you plant one seed, you get ten times back what you put in. But look what Jesus says. He says 30, 60, and even 100 I mean, I, I mean, the folks listening those days, their ears would have perked up because they're thinking, hey, this soil is producing so much more than even the good soil that we have here today. And so what would be the simple application for this soil is this. Be that soil. Be like that soil. That's, this is for unbelievers. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, be like this soil. But also as believers, we must be like this soul, receive the word of God and put it to use in our life and bear fruit and bear fruit in our lives. Now, most of the time when this passage is preached, and I've just quickly moved through it, just a bit of an overview. Most of the time when this passage is, is talked about, it's focused on the soil. And then the question comes, well, which soil are you? Or for our folks online, which soil are you? And I think that's an important question to ask. And, and especially um, if, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Because I pray this morning as I share the gospel with you, the good news about Jesus, that you would be that good soul that embraces it and starts to sprout and take root, believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that old rugged cross with the crown of thorns on his head, with his nails in his hands, nails in his feet, pierced on his side after he was whipped and beaten before he was placed there. He did that for you. He died in your place because of your sin, because of your rebellion to King God, our Heavenly Father, your rebellion to him. He paid the penalty for your sins. And not only did he die on the cross, but he was placed in a tomb. And after three days, he was raised back to life. And God's word says that anyone who believes in him, their sins can be forgiven. They can have eternal life. They can have a home in heaven. They can be reconciled to God. They can have a relationship with God Almighty, the good and loving creator of the universe. 
the Heavenly Father, we can have relationship with all eternity. So my encouragement to you today, I beg you, if you're here in person or even online, wherever you are, if that's you, you've not done that, that you would surrender to Jesus Christ. Believe in Him. Make Him Lord of your life completely. I pray that you would do that. And, and for the rest of my time here, I want to talk about the, a different perspective on this parable. Because I, I mentioned that oftentimes the, the perspective is focused on the soils, but I want to look at the perspective of the sower. Because we see in this passage, I said, you know, we basically can assume, and I think rightly assume, that Jesus is the sower. But when Jesus Christ uh, returned back to the Father, he commissioned and commanded us to do what? To share the gospel, to be witnesses to him. And so now we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are sowers of the word, sowers of the gospel. And so with that in mind, knowing that we have this responsibility, I want to focus on three points, three things that we must keep in mind as we are sowers of the gospel. And here we go. Number one. We must abundantly sow gospel seeds. And all this just fits so well with the gospel to every home. We must abundantly sow gospel seeds. Because what do we... Let's go back to the story and this parable. It seems that this sower, he's sowing generously. And he's almost sowing haphazardlessly. And he's just like sowing here. He's sowing there. I mean, sometimes it's laying on the, on the road. Sometimes it's rocky soil, uh, shallow soil. I mean, he's just sowing, right? You just get this out. He's like, it doesn't matter. He's just out there throwing seeds. He's sowing in expected and he's sowing in unexpected places. There's a sense of, of, of a glorious wastefulness with his sowing, Right? And, and Jotham, he's been in school, and he's been learning about Johnny Appleseed. And, you know, anytime you see a commercial about Johnny Appleseed, you know who traveled around planting the apple seeds and things like this? Anytime you see a cartoon, what's Johnny Appleseed doing? Man, he's just throwing seeds, right? It's like, it's like is that bag? It's like an unlimited bag, right? And he's just throwing apple seeds everywhere, right? Jotham, you were learning about that. And I, I get this idea. It's like this sower. This is what he's doing, man. He's just grabbing the bag. He's just throwing seed everywhere. And see, the gospel to every home is an abundant sowing initiative. Meaning, what's our goal with the gospel to every home? Is to sow the seeds of the gospel. And for us, and this is why we're having a packing party tonight. We're put, what are we putting in there? A Jesus film. It has three films, but including the original Jesus film. It also has a, a gospel track that clearly lays out the gospel. Also, what does it have? It has a gospel pan, pamphlet with the words gospel, G-O-S-B-E-L, with an acronym that clearly lays out the gospel. It's going to include a church invite to say, hey, come and join us at Amble Baptist Church. But also it's going to be involved a personal touch of handing this to somebody. If we see somebody, if, if not, we'll hang it on the door. But a part of that is praying with somebody, with sharing the gospel with our very lips, an abundant gospel sowing initiative. This is what we are doing. Because here's what we need to realize is the seeds of the gospel is an unlimited resource. Unlimited resource. I remember when we moved into the parsonage here next door, and they'd done some. The church had done some work to prepare it for us, which we were certainly grateful for. But there were patches in our yard that didn't have any any sort of grass. So I went down to Southern States, and I got just a small bag of, of seed, grass seed, and I went out and I started throwing. And I didn't know how much I needed. I'd never really sowed grass in a yard before. It was nice, praise the Lord. We actually had a yard, and and we're sowing seed. And as I started to sow seed, I started to realize, I don't think I'm going to have enough. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, not, I, I'm not going to spread as much on this one. You know, put a little bit here and, and finally was able to do it, almost ran out. But it's also like gardening. If you've ever tended to a garden, if you've ever been like going, maybe planting corn or something, and you're going down the row, and you, you're not even close to the end of the row, and what happens? You run out of seed. But here's the thing. The gospel is not like that. When we sow the seeds of the gospel, we need to realize that the gospel is an unlimited resource. Every time we reach in for seeds of the gospel, it's going to be there. It's like the story in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 17. You know when Elijah goes up and he meets this, it's the time of famine, and he meets this widow, and he's like, hey, can you give me something to eat? And she's like, well, actually, I'm collecting sticks, and I'm about to go make the last meal for my son, and I'm, we're going to die. And he says, no, no. 
Don't worry about that. He said, go prepare a meal. You fix me something to eat. And, and God's word tells us that every time the woman went to get flour, every time the woman went to get oil during the famine, it was always there. It's just like this never-ending supply of oil and flour. And I can't think the gospel is like that. Every time we reach in for the gospel, it's there. And we can spread it. We can abundantly sow. And also, as I was thinking about this week, it's an, another important realization is this. Is that seed will not grow unless it's sowed. Unless we sow it. Right? Seed will not grow unless it is sowed. See, we, I've got a bag. I remember a couple years ago, I bought a little packet of some seeds. And I kept thinking I was going to plant them and never got around to it. So they stayed in my drawer for about two or three years. Maybe you've, some of you have done this. Maybe basil. I can't remember what it was at that time. And I took it out and I looked at it. And after a couple of years, I thought, wow, the seeds are still here. They've not sprouted, nothing like this. And I went out back and, and found a little place and I planted them. And after a week, I started to see the sprouts sticking up out of the soil. See, seed will not grow unless it is first sowed. And this is the same way with the gospel. If we want to see the gospel take root in lives of people, we've got to sow, right? This is why we're doing this. I sometimes wonder why we don't, the, the reason we don't see people coming to faith in Christ is because we never sow the seed of the gospel. Because if we're sowing the seed of the gospel, it's going to start taking, excuse me, it's going to start taking root. The same for the gospel. So number one, we must abundantly sow gospel seeds. Number two, we must not be selective in our gospel sowing. We must not be selective in our gospel sowing. See, when we, when we abundantly sow and we're throwing the seeds out, we don't know where, what type of soil that seed will land on, right? Sometimes I wish we did, but we don't. We don't know. We just sow the seeds of the gospel. And from the surface, the sower can't tell from the surface. And this is the same way for us when we share the gospel. We don't know who we're sharing the gospel with. This is why the gospel at every home includes every home. And why is that? Because when we go up to a door and we knock on that door, we don't know who's behind that door. We don't know who lives in that home. We don't know if they're a follower of Jesus Christ or not. We don't know what type of soil that they are. I was at my family's house this past weekend and, and uh, the TV was on and, and the show Let's Make a Deal was there. And most of you know this show, right? It's kind of a fun show. I think the pandemic has really changed how they do it. But of course in that show, you know, the, the host will come to somebody and they'll give them like $100. And they say, hey, you can keep that $100 or you can have what's behind this door. And of course, what's behind that door could be a car, or it could be a box of garbage bags. You, know, you just don't know what's behind that. And they have to choose what they're going to do. And I can't help but think, as I was just uh, preparing this message, this is a lot like when we go to knock on a door, or maybe when we share the gospel with a friend, a relative, or family, it's like that door. We don't know what's behind that door. But God commands us to share the gospel anyway. And so often I think the people that we think are ready for the gospel aren't. And then sometimes the people that we think are far away from God are sometimes the people that are ready to hear that God has been preparing and getting ready. So we see that we must not be selective in our sowing. But now you say, David, well, what about, doesn't God's word speak about don't throw your... Pearls to swine? Let, let's talk about that a minute. And actually, here's an exception. Let's read Matthew 7, 6. It should show up on the screen here. Jesus is, is, is speaking there, and he says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What's he saying here? He's Jesus First off, we're not selective in who we share the gospel with, but there may be times when the gospel is unwelcome, when the gospel is resisted. And we are increasingly living in a day and time in a culture where people resist. They don't even want to hear the gospel message spoken. I think in those cases, if someone's angry, someone won't listen, what do we do? We, we hold on to our pearls. We don't, we don't throw them. Now, that doesn't mean we don't pray for that person, but in a sense, we, we dust, the, the sand, uh, uh, dust our sandals and move on as, as the, the New Testament shares there. I'll share a story with you. 
when, uh, when we were in the Middle East, we were there in Abu Dhabi, and we went out to a labor camp, and I was with uh, my Nepalese translator and good friend, Pawan, and we, we were just walking through this labor camp. I mean, there's people everywhere, and, and we, know, we see this guy there, and we notice that he's got some sort of skin disease. It's almost like he had little tumors all over his body. And so we stop, and we strike up a conversation with him, and we just simply say, hey, can we, can we pray for you? And we prayed that God, we shared with who we were. We, we prayed with him in the name of Jesus. We prayed that God would heal him. Now, I wish I could tell you that God miraculously healed him in that moment, but he didn't. But we prayed for his healing. We don't know what happened in the days to come and the way God worked. But after we prayed for this man, he invited us into his home. And it was probably a room maybe a little bit smaller in this space up here with about 12 to 14 guys living in that space in bunk beds. And so we're there, we're just sharing the gospel with him, talking with him, and his roommate comes in, and he says, hey, I know who you are, and you're not welcome here. We don't want you here. This was his, this was his roommate, and of course, everybody cramped in there in the, in the same place, so we said, okay. So we're not going to throw the pearls of swine today. We're, we're going to politely step out, and, and I think we talked with the man outside. We don't want to press in on a place where the gospel is not welcome. We pray that God would work in their heart to make them ready to hear and receive the gospel. So number one, we abundantly sow seeds. Number two, we must not be selective in our sowing. And number three, this is important. We must trust God to bring forth growth. We must trust God to bring the growth as we sow the seeds of the gospel. I guess probably a year, maybe two years ago now, we were walking through the, the book of 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 7, Paul writes there and he says this, So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase or God who gives the growth. So what's he saying? He said, hey, we can sow the seeds, we can water, we can plant, we can fertilize, but ultimately who brings forth the growth? God. God himself. We're called to sow, yes, but God brings forth growth. Think about a farmer when he goes out and he plants his crops, right? He puts the seeds in the ground and then what does he have to do? He just has to wait. He has to trust that God is going to give the sunlight. God is going to give the rain. Because if God doesn't do that, is this crop, is these plants going to grow? No. He has to trust that God would bring forth the growth. This is the same way for us. We must radically trust the power of the gospel. Romans 1, what does Paul say? He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God. It's not our power. It's the power of the gospel when we share it. And this is encouraging. We don't have to be the best speaker. We don't have to know uh, every single verse in the Bible. We don't have to be a pastor. None of these things. We have to be willing to share the gospel. That is encouraging. We don't rely on our own ability to share. We rely on the power of the gospel. Because, and also we see that God is also the one who prepares the soil. God is the one who tills, he fertilizes, he removes the huge rocks. He does this in ways that we don't always see and know. When we meet a person, we don't know what God has been doing in their, pers- in their life leading up to this point where we interact with them or we share the gospel with them. God is always at work. He's preparing the soil in advance. And yes, we can help in some ways, but by and large, it is God's work. And this is why... We've started the 40 days of prayer. This is why we're going out prayer, walking, prayer, driving on Wednesday. Why? Because it's God. God who brings forth the growth. God is the one who tills and prepares the soil. And so as we go out and we sow the seeds of the gospel, not only in in this initiative, but in our daily lives, we're going to have, what are we going to have? We're going to have failures and successes. Some people may accept Jesus Christ. As Lord and Savior. Now we pray that every person we interact with, if they're not a believer, that they would do that. And even the soils in this story reveal this. You ever notice how many soils there are? Really four, but I think there's, you could technically say that there's six soils. Why is that? Because there's three that reject the gospel, right? The first three. And then there's three that accept the gospel. Because the good soil speaks of the soil that produces 30 and the soil that produces 60. And the soil that produces a hundred. So we see there's going to be successes and failures. But ultimately, it's not about us and how we share. It's whether we share or not. And ultimately, God is the one that brings forth the growth. 
I want to share a passage with you in Isaiah. I'm going to start wrapping things up. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. We take encouragement that there is power in the word, that when we speak God's word, it does not come back void. It is going to work and do what God wants it to accomplish it, accomplish it to do. And we're reminded that our success, don't miss this, our success as we share the gospel it's not wrapped up in whether someone becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. It's wrapped up in whether in our obedience and whether we are willing to go and spread the gospel, whether we're willing to go and sow the seeds of the gospel. Because when the seed lands on good soil, it has the potential to take root and multiply. And we should be encouraged by this. And let me just cast a vision here. Because it has the potential to take root and multiply. When we share the gospel, we never know who we are sharing the gospel with. Two, we don't know what soy, but also when we go out and we go, we knock on a door, we may interact with the next Billy Graham, right? I mean, Billy Graham came to faith in Christ at some point. What if the person we lead to Christ grows up? Maybe they're a child, maybe they're an adult, or maybe they go and they lead hundreds to faith in Jesus Christ. We don't know who. We may go out, we may interact with the new pastor or the future pastor of Anvil Baptist Church. Wouldn't that be cool? Being able to go out and interact. I will share one, one final story that emphasizes this. There's a guy by the name of Paul Chitwood. Maybe some of you, some familiar, but most of you probably not. Paul Chitwood was the leader of the Kentucky Baptist Convention for several years, of which we're a part. And he also now leads the International Mission Board, which is one of the largest mission agencies in, in the entire world. Uh, very influential man. And he tells the story about when he was a boy. That there was his, him and his father and his family, they didn't go to church. But he said, one day, there's a group of deacons, unknown, nameless deacons from a local church that were out visiting. And they stopped at his house as a young boy. And they knocked on that door. They shared the gospel. And they invited them to come to church. And it was through that interaction that he would eventually come to faith in Jesus Christ and is now seen, seen such great work done in and through his life. This is why we're going, taking the gospel to every home. This is why we take the gospel to our friends and our relatives and, and our colleagues is because we don't know how God is going to use that person, how they're going to multiply, whether 60, 30, or even 100 in their life. So here we go. Number one, we must abundantly sow the seeds of the gospel as a church, as families, and as individuals. Number two, we must not be selective in our sowing. We don't know where the gospel seed is going to land. And number three, we must tr trust that God is going to bring forth the growth. There's nothing that we can do. It's only God. We must be faithful and obedient in sowing the seeds. And so my prayer is that we would be a church that abundantly sows the seeds of the gospel and that we would leave the rest to God. We would sow the seeds and we would leave the rest to God. And, and I pray that we would do this each and every day of our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this parable that Jesus told so long ago how it can still apply to our lives, God. And I just pray that we'd be faithful in sowing the seeds of the gospel. And, and we can't do this on our own. God, we need one another, and ultimately we need you. God, I pray if there's anyone here today or even online who've not accepted your Son as Lord and Savior, God, I pray that today would be the day that they would do that. Humble themselves, God. They would prove themselves to be that good soil today. God, thank you for the work that you've done behind the scenes already in preparation. And God, I pray that every person today would just be obedient to you. That's our prayer. In your son's name we pray. Amen. This is going to end our online uh, broadcast. As always, if anyone wants to talk or pray, I'm always available. And we're going to have just a time of invitation. We're going to... Stand and sing what number, brother? 194. 194. Let's stand and sing. I'll be up front.